Good morning again. Welcome to Deer Park's First Baptist Church, Adult Bible Study. If you're following along in the book, we're Kaleo number 46. Now, you, you know that there's only 48 lessons in that book, so you do the math. We're getting close to the end of that book, and, and we'll have some, some Christmas-type messages uh, coming up after that. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, we're at today. You know, it's been said that, that the most miserable person in the world is a child of God running from God. I hope you've never been there. I, I hope you, you've never crossed that bridge and hope you don't ever cross that bridge. But one of the things we know, if you do cross that bridge, if you run across that situation where you have allowed a seed of doubt to go into your mind about your salvation, this is the book for you, 1 John. 1 John 5, verse 13 says this, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. The first time I saw that, it just lit me up, because I, I had... Uh, an incident there where I was struggled with some of that, allowed that seed of doubt to germinate a bit. And when I found this, I went on a search in Scripture and I found that verse. Well, well, here it is. It says if you, you do what's in this book, you'll know whether you're a Christian or not. See, John laid out some tests for us. How do you know that you know? And if you look look at these, uh, right down the line, if you look at the, the admittance and confession of sin, admit you have sin, confess that sin, in, in uh, 1 John 1, 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Now, you may recognize that. I don't know if you write in your Bible or not. I, I, I write a lot in my Bible, underline and scratch stuff. I can't read half of it, but nonetheless, I do that simply because that was that text right there was Jim's first sermon here on October the 6th, 2019. Was that the first John? And, now, and then there's another test uh, John puts out there. He says, are you walking in obedience? That's also in chapter 2. A third test, are you walking in love? Are you forsaking the world? And then we understand when we, we study the centrality of Jesus, that's simply the distinctiveness of Jesus Christ. You see, you hear all the time there, guys, that uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as you believe something. Well, that, that's baloney. We know that. We have to understand that the distinction of Jesus is that he died for you and I for our remission of sins. In verse 1 and 2, we see right off the bat that John says this, he says, my little children, I'm writing this to you, my little children, so that you may not sin. See, there, there's one time there was a, there was a pastor that, that was preaching about sin to, to, to the church, Sunday after Sunday, and one of the Christians in the, in, in the congregation came up to him after the sermon, he said, Pastor, said, I, I no, you just keep preaching about sin in here. And he said, you know, you understand now that sin is different for the Christian than it is for the non-Christian. And the pastor said, yeah, it's much worse. <laughs> so, you see, it, it is much worse for a Christian than to follow the sin. And the pastor was right on. Now, John is in his 90s at this time. We believe that because we, we, we've read that before. We understand that John is in a 90-something years old. And he had the right to address us as my children. You know, it, it, John is the last of his generation. The last person maybe still alive at this point that, that, had the, to, to, that knew and he walked with Jesus. In 1 John, you know, where you see that is in 1 John 1. Back up to the first, verse, first chapter of this, uh, of this book. And you see verses 1, 2, and 3. John says that. He said, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. So he had seen Jesus. He had looked at him, he touched him with his hand. And he said this, that, you know, John is now in Ephesus. Uh, when we were in Ephesus uh, not too long ago, 
we were told that uh, the the elders of the church there at Ephesus is the one that, uh, that encouraged John to write the little epistle there, first, first, second, and third John. And I'm so glad they did because it, it says so much to us. You see, John's words here are not meant to impress or to chide or, or to put pressure on someone. He says, if you sin. See, John wants to communicate a close, he wants a, a loving affection. And it, it'd be like a, a grandfather uh, just uh, taking a, a grandson or a granddaughter and setting him on his lap and saying, now, now child, if you sin. One of the things that we see here, Chuck Swindoll, he kind of outlined these verses that we that were studying this morning. And the first outline he put on was, was don't mess with stuff that gets you in trouble. <laughs> it's a good idea, isn't it? And, and so, you know, say, well, it, it, but, but what he said in that verse 1 and 2, can we, said, can we not sin? Can we cannot sin? See, it's not so much that you cannot, but that you may not. That's what he said. So I write to you so that you may not sin. That, that may be explained in Genesis 4, 7. It's a verse that I've, I've studied uh, and looked at a number of times because you remember the story when Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to, to Jesus, to the Lord. And, and Cain's was not accepted. Now, he was down in the mouth about that. He walked around with his head down and open and all of this stuff. And and, uh, and the Lord came to him and, and said, Cain, sin is crouching at your door and you must master it. When I saw that verse the first time, I said, wow. So we, we cannot sin. Yes, you can. You cannot do it. You may not sin. Now, we know we have a carnal nature, but you can say no. You see, sin never can be regarded as normal in the life of a believer. It's just not, you know, well, everybody's doing it. That's okay with me. As far as we, no, no, no. It, sin can never be regarded as normal in the life of a believer. See, John's love for Christians is clear here. He's, he's, very, uh, he's very tender with what he says, but he's very real with what he says also. And rule number two, when you foul things up, remember you have someone who's always in your corner. See, if anyone does sin, you're not kicked out of the family. You know, and not, you're not one and done with that. You sin, you have an advocate. That advocate is Jesus Christ. It's through our scripture, guys. He will represent us before the bar of God's judgment. And he will say, that was mine. See, Jesus is that atoning sacrifice, guys, for sin. And that's where that 75 cent word propitiation comes from. Jesus has satisfied God's wrath for the penalty of sin by his death on the cross. See, that is the unlimited atonement. If you look at the, the Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism, you know, the, the, the acronym that uh, is, is TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, the L stands for limited atonement. God, this is not this is not limited atonement. This is unlimited atonement when he died for the sins of all who belong to him. Now, in verses 3 through 5, John talks about how does our fellowship grow deeper? He said, well, we say we love Jesus, but on what level? How can we how can we love, how do we know what level we love Jesus on? I, I, I assure you, you know me, my name is Paul, and you know me, but on that, not on the level that Glendine knows me. See, it, it is an experiential knowledge, not, a, not an intellectual knowledge that, that, that you have of me. And so we understand that, guys, and so we just have to know, but on what level do we love Jesus? Rule number three, Behave like a member of the family. Oh boy. And John is saying, this is how we know that we know. You know, have you ever heard a husband and wife say, that child of yours? You see, like that, that's, that didn't come from them. Uh, and, and, and we've heard that before. I, I might have said that before. One of the ways you know that, that you know is follow his commandments. Jesus said that. Be obedient to his word, guys. See, this is, this is what, what 
But John is telling us here today. John said, if you know him and do not keep his commandments, you're a liar. Now, I didn't say that. The scripture says that. John said that. If you just know him and you go about and do your own thing, you do not keep the commandments as he's outlining, you're a liar. See, to John, it was that simple, God. Simply that simple. Obedience separates the true believer from the wannabe. Are you a wannabe or are you a true believer? Then obey his commandments. Polycarp would have, you, you've heard me mention Polycarp before. He was, he was uh, the bishop of, of Smyrna. And so he was born about AD 70. He was a disciple of John. Now, and during the persecution of the church, the Roman emperor bound him up, put him on a pole to burn him at the stake. But he offered him freedom if he would deny Christ. Here's the words that that, uh, that Polycarp spoke. Eighty and six years I have served Christ. How can I curse him, my king and savior? Polycarp knew that he knew. And what a great feeling that is. What a great atom of comfort it is to know that you know that you're a child of the king. Rule number six. No, number four, I mean. No matter what you say, your actions tell the truth. You know, we can talk a good line, we can everything, but if we don't walk in that line, uh, people pick up on that real quick. Uh, that's what we call a hypocrite in some circles. Uh, so he said, if we remain in him, we should walk as he walks. You understand that? We, we got to walk the way Jesus walked if we're going to remain in it. Now, that word remain in Deer Park English means hang out with. You realize, guys, that you cannot hang out with Jesus Christ without it rubbing off on you. You can't stay in his word without it rubbing off on you. You can't, you can't talk to him daily, praying to him without it rubbing off on you. So keep that in mind as you go, that no matter what you say, your actions will tell the real truth. Tony Evans puts it this way. I like the way Tony Evans puts things. He says, when it comes to making tea, some people take the tea bag and they dip it here, and then they dip it there, and they dip it here, just dip it around in the hot water a little bit. That's the same approach many Christians take with church guys. See, they dip it in the church here, and they go over here and dip it in the church a little bit, and back over here, maybe dip it a little bit on Sunday mornings only, and it changes the water very little that you dip it in. Now, other tea drinkers place their tea, tea bags in the water. And they not only place them in there, they let that water boil until it extracts the flavor out of the tea bag. And the tea seeps into the water and transforms it. That's what we need to remember, guys. We, we, we need to be that kind of tea drinker that, 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 uh, that boils in and, and lets it come out with changing its form. For, see, for Christ to influence and transform your life, you must remain in him. You must put it in the water and boil it and, and get, extract all you can out of it. Now, in, in verses 7 through 11, John is saying, that, well, it, it boils down to which commandments do I need to keep? And John says, well, uh, there's one big one. And I'll just stick with it, he says. It's not a new commandment. It's not a new covenant. It's in the Old Testament, matter of fact. But he said, it's fresh now. I, need, I want it fresh on your mind. I want you to understand it fully this time. Because it becomes the governing commandment to the Christian life. And that is simply in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. A Pharisee asked Jesus a question. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. This is the foremost great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. See, if this love had a place in your heart, all others will fall in place. See, the rabbis, the rabbis had a say that, that the Gentiles were created to be fuel for the fires of hell. So does that, does that say you love your brother? You've told me, you've heard me talk about Opal and how she got around that verse. She just didn't call him a brother. And so 
We don't bless her hard. She, uh, but she was, she was a good person. You see, when you love your, your brother or sister, you want to meet their need that brings glory to God. When you love someone, you want to meet their need. You don't want to see them hurt. You don't want to see them suffering. And see, when you do that, you remain in the light. Because you're walking with Jesus in that light. And then when they have a lot of light, there's no cause for stumbling. Keep that in mind as, as we as we think about loving that brother of ours and that sister of ours. And then John says this, however, one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness still. You're out of fellowship with God when you hate your brother. What's well, a good thing to, to, to know right now, guys, with the, with the advent of the, uh, the, the campaign and, and the election and all this stuff, you see, we're out of fellowship with God when we hate a brother or sister regardless of that. We're walking around in darkness and we know that doing that and never ends well is to walk around in darkness. Verses 12 through 14, John tells us then who we are. He says, you're little children whose sins have been forgiven. John divides believers into three categories. He talks about fathers, young men, and children. Now, it, it also relates to the, to the spiritual development of, of each one of those groups of people. Now, one of the things that, that we know that children know their father. Children understand. They're, they're uh, I guess, responsible for what the information they understand and know. See, they... Uh, they, they take all different stages of development themselves. But as we get to know our Father, we must not remain children. We must get off of that milk and get into whole food. As, as we, that's what he's saying as children now. You know what you know, but don't remain the child. Grow up. Be a Christian. And then he talks about young men. Another group of people. Young men. We think about that sometimes, guys, as as uh, we we all as young men we battle the teenage years we we went through some up and down times and, and and simply what John would tell us there is guys just don't buy Satan's lies <laughs> just don't do it, it, it don't uh, it, forget that if it feels good do it stuff just don't buy those lies just walk away just walk away you know throughout history. God has had his strong young men. We think of these patriarchs as all being 95 or 100. You know, we think of being old and, 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 the, and the great patriarchs of history. We always thought about it being old. But let me tell you, let me just read you a few here. It, this is quite surprising to me. Martin Luther, he was 27 years old when he realized that salvation was faith by faith, not by works. 27. And he was 34 when he nailed those 95 theses to the door of that church in Wittenberg. 20, 34, I mean, 34. George Mueller was 27 when he moved to Bristol and opened an or orphanage strictly on the basis of faith. And that became renowned as our first Sunday school. John Bunyan was 32 when he was jailed for preaching. In that prison, he wrote his immortal Pilgrim Progress, 32. William Booth was 36 when he founded the Salvation Army. David Brain was 25 when he set out to convert the American Indian. He was 29 when he died. William Carey was still in his teens when he could read the Bible in six languages. Wow, it's embarrassing, isn't it? I can't hardly read it in one. William Carey could read it in six languages. He was 32 when he went to India and launched the modern missionary era. He's called the, the, the father of missionaries. See, such are God's strong young men, guys. The world is a better place because of them. And then he gets down. We've had the children. We've had the youth. He gets down to fathers now. He's referring to fathers as, as mature believers. They have persevered over the long haul. That's that perseverance versus assurance. We persevere through life. You see, no longer do the circumstances of life dictate their actions. Because of what they're going through, 
They're honest with God. They, they cling to God. See, their eyes are on the eternal and in life. Now, what stage of life are you? Think about that for a minute. Are, are, you, are you still a child? Are you still learning? Are you, are you still on, on the milk of the word? Maybe you're, you're a young person. You're going through the struggle of life, through the teenage years, all of those. And then many of you are mature believers. You would be the fathers he's talking about. Just keep that in mind if, if we continue to go through this. And in verse 15, John says, love not the world, really. Now see, you have to understand here, John is not talking about planet Earth. He's not talking about the globe we see as a planet Earth. He's talking about an organized system headed by Satan that draws us away from God's will and God's love. There's three things in this world that John would say, stay away from, love, not those things. One is the personal force of evil, and that's Satan himself, the personal force of evil. Number two would be man's fallen nature. That's the flesh. That's the carnal nature we have. We're born with that carnal nature. We, we can't get rid of it right now. We will it one day be rid of it. But that's the fallen nature. That's the flesh part that he's talking about. And then there's this world system, guys. That's human society organizing and functioning outside the will of God. What, what is, what is, the, what is the, the scripture called uh, Satan? He's the prince of this world, right? He's the prince of this world. You see, there are no Christian political systems. Literally, they're all of the world because they come from society organized and operating outside the will of God. We wish it were different, but it's not. See, see, our society literally is godless. Now, why, why do we say that? Well, in Romans 12, 2, we, we remember that verse very well. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of mind. God said, don't, don't be conformed to this world. This, this world is evil, God. It, it, it's godless. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in verse 16 and 17, we see, we see John doing something else here. You see, he asked, what does the world offer you? What does the world offer you this day? See, the world promises to satisfy legitimate desires by illegitimate means. <laughs> That's lust of the flesh he's talking about in those verses. Lust of the flesh. Satisfying legitimate desires and illegitimate means. Now, how do we, how do we know that? Well, we know one thing, eating is legitimate, right? We have to eat to live. Gluttony is worldly and is a sin. You see, thirst is not evil. We all get thirsty. But drunkenness is a sin and it's worldly. Sex is legitimate. It is a gift of God. The sexual nature of married couples. But we know that immorality is worldly. Immorality is sin. See, the world tempts your mind through what your eyes see. That's the lust of the eyes. You know, you think about this for a minute, guys. The, the, the rabbis had a saying that the, the eyes in, are the windows of the soul. The eyes are the windows to the soul of man. Now, what's this now? Generally, what, what happens here is that what you take in by your eyes works its way through your head, down your body, through your shoulder, down your arm, and manifests itself in your hand. You think about that. That's the reality of something. When we, when we take something in with our eyes that's unholy and not godly, it works its way out through the hand of life. Now, pride of life, that's in one's possessions. You see, that's living to impress others because of what you have. And John says, when we're in love with the world, we forget the world is passing away. <laughs> you know that, don't you? Don't hang on to something that's passing away, guys, because the, verse 17 says the world is passing away. So you better hang on to something that's eternal. And then he says, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. 
What are some great things that John tells us here in these, in these 17 verses? I, I want to conclude by just simply saying this. Now go back over these rules that, uh, that Chuck Swindoll had laid out for us. Number one, don't mess with stuff that gets in you in trouble. That's simple enough, isn't it? Just don't do it. Just resist it. When he told God, told Cain, that sin is crouching at your door, but you must conquer it. Call on that verse right there. And rule number two, when you foul things up, remember you have someone always in your corner. That's our advocate, Jesus Christ. Rule number three, behave like a member of the family. Behave like you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and you're on your way to eternity. And no matter what you say, your actions tell the truth about your character. Rule number five, says always remember that your obedience reveals how much you respect your father. Rule number six, when you're looking for an example to follow, choose Jesus. And rule number seven is love your brothers and sisters. Guys, remember now, <clears throat> in closing this, this time, it does not matter how old we are. That's irrelevant. You can be nine or you can be 90. It does not matter. But we're never too old to sit at the feet of John in a family meeting and learn the basics of family values. So let's do that. Let's work on that. Let's work on that in this coming Thanksgiving, this coming uh, season of Christmas. Let's work on those things and learn from John. Little children, I write this so that you may not sin. I want to thank you for being here today. I'm going to say a short prayer and then we'll be dismissed from this session. Lord Jesus, you just, you're good to us. Lord, you're the giver of good things, and we thank you for that. Lord, we know in our heart of hearts that we sometimes, we don't be obedient to you the way we should. We don't love others the way we should. Lord, we, we fall by the wayside in many times in life, but God strengthen us. I thank you for lifting us up. I thank you for forgiving us. I thank you for... Uh, maybe setting us on your lap and, and assuring us of the things to come. And Lord, may we always remember that, God, that, that you're our advocate. You're the one that's going to stand before us on Judgment Day and say, that sin is forgiven. That sin is forgiven. He's a child of mine. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks, for being here today. We'll do it again next week.